Hello, please let me see your ticket stubs for the double-edged double bill. This week, it's Boris Karloff in The Terror of the Old Dark House. Adam Thomas and Thomas Mariani will come to the table to discuss the randomly selected yin and yang of a double feature. Then, both will have to pick a number between 1 and 10 or seal their fate to the next episode. One will have two good movies, the other two bad ones. Let the chaos begin. I am Adam Thomas, and I'm back, baby! And I am Thomas Mariani, and I've done it. I've brought my co-host back from the dead! He's alive! But I can turn into a bird or something. I don't know what the fuck I can do. We'll fix it in post. It's fine. We'll do some reshoots. It'll work. Yeah. No, it won't. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody, to the Double Edge Devil Bill, uh, where every week Adam and I uh, discuss a good and a bad movie um, related to a topic. And, you know, we're in the middle of October, spooky season. And uh, this time, you know, last episode, which unfortunately Adam was not on. Welcome back, Adam, to the show. Yeah, all right. So glad to be back. I didn't have to drag him back at all uh, to to be on here. Um, But uh, last time we went to Blumhouse, which is much more recent horror, and it's a contrast. We're going all the way back uh, to uh, the career of Mr. Boris Karloff, who uh, we like covering at least like, you know, a certain sort of like horror icon uh, whenever we do our horror month. And, um, you know, Karloff is one of the originals. He's a guy who has a fascinating career that ranges from the silent movie era all the way to, like, the late 60s. At least, like, over the first half of the 20th century of film. Yeah, he's done some stuff. I mean, not really prolific or anything iconic or anything like that, though. That's the thing. I mean, he hasn't worked in 50 years. Like, fucking lazy bum. I know, know, bro. You gotta stay relevant. So, I assume, Adam, I think we both share this problem, which a lot of people do. That, like, for at least younger fans first at least heard Mr. Karloff through something like the Grinch special, right? Yeah, I mean, you've seen him probably before that, though, you know, as Frankenstein or stuff like that. I mean, that's such a iconic, classic image that most everybody grows up knowing that image. But, yeah, that probably is the first time actually having any sort of experience with Karloff's work would probably be the Grinch, yeah. To the point where, like, when I was younger, like, I was aware of, uh, long before I'd seen those Frankenstein movies, at least of that image, like you're mentioning, but I did not connect that voice until, like, much later, when I would see him actually perform and things. I'm like, this, it, it initially was kind of discombobulating, because it's like, what, wait, <laughs> the Grinch voice is attached to Frankenstein. It just, it feels like it wouldn't work, but it, it makes so much more sense, and it's such a great distinctive voice, which you obviously didn't hear in the original Frankenstein, um, because uh, the makeup, the Jack Pierce makeup, would not allow him to speak uh, be- because of like it was so sunken in. And even in our, our good movie, he's not going to be speaking that much. But I love the weird sort of like British regality mixed with this slight lisp. Just makes it so distinctive a voice. Oh yeah, definitely, man. There, there's no question. Whenever you hear him, that it's Boris Karloff. I mean, without seeing him or anything, yeah, it's I. Uh, you know, him and his even. A few of his contemporaries at the time, they had such iconic sort of presences and including, you know, all the way down to just the, their manner of speaking. Like anytime you hear Karloff, you know, it's Karloff. Anytime you hear Bella Lugosi, you know, it's Bella Lugosi. Yeah, Karloff, he, he's an icon for many, many, many reasons. Well, what do you think maybe separates Karloff from his contemporaries? What do you think makes him distinctive from Lugosi, Lon Chaney Jr., some of those like other universal monster actors? he really sort of escaped into the character in any way he could, be it via makeup or sort of the lack of speaking in some movies or just sort of the regality of him when he did have speaking roles. It's just, there's, you know, Lugosi, of course, and Chaney and all that, but Karloff was just sort of second to none. The, the, The image of Frankenstein alone, I mean, yeah, of course, everybody knows what Bella Lugosi looks like as Dracula and, you know, Chaney's the Wolfman and all that, but there's none of them that even hit sort of the pop cultural zeitgeist and still really as prevalent as sort of 
Karloff's monster. And then just to sort of just have that staying power alone just through a simple image is just insane. I think the big thing for me is, like, I look at him as sort of, like, this interesting middle ground between, like, at different ends of, like, either monstrousness versus sort of the tragic sympathy you would have Universal Monsters. On either end, you have Bela Lugosi, who's obviously much more of, like, as Dracula, so much of the appeal is, like, oh, he's, like, sensual and, like, monstrous in his own right, but fascinating no matter what. And on the other side, you have Lon Chaney Jr., who is, like, I mean, I like the Wolfman and stuff like that, but Lon Chaney Jr. was always, like, just a sad sack. Like, that dude, oh. whenever he smiled in those movies, it looked like it was a put-on. <laughs> like, there was no actual joy to be found <laughs> in Lon Chaney Jr., like, as a physical presence, necessarily. And I think Karloff is, like, in that middle tier to where, like, he could, had a bit more versatility in terms of, like, when he could go into, like, the monstrous attitude with, like, Frankenstein, it would be generally upsetting and intimidating, but also he could have that genuine pathos and tragedy that he could lean on and he could really balance it so well i think that's the thing is that he i would say of the sort of bigger universal monster folks he was probably the most diverse in range in terms of an actor no disrespect to someone like claude rains and some of the other guys who are quite good but like you can even just see i think we'll be talking about this with one of our features that when he's playing like big brooding silent types there's still like a world of difference between Frankenstein and maybe his character in our good movie, for example, two very different performances, despite being fairly similar in terms of the, the basics of what they are. Oh yeah, definitely, man. I, I absolutely agree with that. Like I said, he disappeared into every role he did in just the way he would carry his posture or anything like that. Like, yeah, him as uh, Morgan compared to the creature. Yeah, it is similar as far as, you know, sort of the big lumbering, the makeup, all that stuff. But it's vastly, vastly different. Yeah, I would recommend anybody out there watch the um, the Boris Karloff Man Behind the Monster documentary that's on Shudder currently. Um, it's not a great documentary, but I just learned like a lot of interesting aspects I wasn't even aware of with Karloff. Like the fact that he was born in England, obviously, but also I didn't know that his um, parents were Anglo-Indian. Which basically means like his father had like an Indian mother and his mother had like Indian ancestry, which explains why he has like a darker complexion than a lot of the other Universal Monster people, which is why he also, admittingly, uh, kind of got, you know, a bit ostracized, and more importantly, uh, cast in a, a bit more offensive roles, depending on the production. Uh, yeah, yeah, that happened quite a bit. I mean, like, you know, quite frankly, a very white, pasty crowd of actors that would usually be there. You would notice that, like, he just kind of, like, stood out from the rest in a way that makes him fit perfectly for Frankenstein, which I've said before many times, is my favorite of the Universal Monsters. I just think that Frankenstein has this fascinating, tragic outsider territory to where, like I said, he can be like very much a scary monster at certain points, but I always believe that tragedy and that pathos is really consistent in at least the first two Frankensteins. Then, like, Son of Frankenstein, he starts getting to be like, oh, I'm just kind of there in the background. And then once Karloff leaves, it is total just like, Arr. <laughs> like that's all it is <laughs> like that role really does like suffer without somebody like a Karloff to give the pathos to it I absolutely agree and I think Frankenstein's probably my favorite as well I'd say Frankenstein and then maybe the creature just because of the way the creature looks but yeah I absolutely agree the Frankenstein creature and it's been done now how many times by how many different people and uh the only one that's even come close to being as good to me even is Peter Boyle but um yeah, I absolutely, Frankenstein's, you know, number one, baby. Yeah, most of the ones who at least have worked uh, besides him have been ones that try and appeal more to, like, the novel version. Like, I would say, say, there was that one, like, filmed production of, like, John Lee Miller and Benedict Cumberbatch uh -huh. trading off on playing Frankenstein. And those, like, once again, they mainly do sort of, like, the novel version of it. Versus, like, if you're trying to do classic Frankenstein, it's, it's, you can't compete with Karloff on that. I don't know. I mean, I know it's based on the novel one, but De Niro... I mean, sure, fine, but I mean, the, the real answer here is Aaron Eckhart. Yeah, no, Aaron Eckhart for right. sure, and whoever the yeah. fuck played him in Van Helsing. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, but let's go ahead and get into our features item that we picked uh, at the end of the last episode. Uh, we have your good pick, which is The Old Dark House, which, interesting fact, is the oldest movie we've ever covered on the show. From 1932. Yeah, I didn't even do that on purpose, but I'm going to take credit for it, baby. <laughs> yeah, you go into older, you're cultured, right? Yep, That's what... yep. That just goes to show I'm the smarter one. 
Yes, for sure. And then we'll be covering the bad pick that I had, which was The Terror from 1963. So we're getting the two ends of his career, for sure, with that. Uh, but let's go ahead and start off with uh, the earlier picture, James Whale's The Old Dark House. They want to know if they can stay here for the night. Here we are, six people sitting around. What do we know about each other? Not a thing. I've got a funny feeling. Something dreadful might happen to us. You don't seem to understand. We may be cut off, shut up in this house. There's a madman upstairs. You're afraid, aren't you? You don't believe in God, and yet you're afraid to die. So, uh, The Old Dark House came out October 20th, 1932, from director James Whale. Uh, So this is right off the heels of the original Frankenstein, being such a big hit. And uh, Universal, you know, decided to greenlit, like, hey, James, do another movie for us. We'll do whatever you want to do. Frankenstein was such a big hit. And uh, he decided to direct this movie that was based on um, a novel called Benighted, which from what I've heard is much more of like a dark, somber, like post the Great War novel. Um, And uh, the screenwriters, uh, Ben Levy and R.C. Sheriff, decided to turn it into more of like a comedic script. And I think this is the first time you really get to see James be able to get that hint of humor that made him so famous uh, with uh, his subsequent movies. Because the original Frankenstein, not much of the humor that is usually... Uh, very whale-esque is in there, but with this movie and then going onward to The Invisible Man, and especially Bride of Frankenstein, uh, he is allowed to get very silly and campy. And Adam, despite being your pick, uh, you actually had never seen The Old Dark House before, yes? That is very, very, very accurate. Good for you. I remember that you told me you hadn't seen it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I did? Who are you? Um, no, I yeah, I had never seen this before. Um, I hadn't seen a lot of the sort of non-main, you know, obviously Frankenstein, stuff like that, but I'm not as familiar on Karloff as I'd like to be. I mean, obviously I know who he is, and I've seen quite a few of his things, but there's definitely ones that have sort of passed me by, and this was one of them that sort of always had a reputation as far as it being pretty good, and obviously James Whale and and him teaming up with Karloff again and all that. It's just I I never got a chance to see it, so that's kind of why I chose it, give me an excuse. The best part of this movie, other than Karloff's pretty fun, but these sort of fight scenes are just the best. They are absolutely the greatest things ever put to film. That and Saul. <laughs> what the fuck? But yeah, no, I, I really I enjoyed it. I had a good time with it. It, it. You know, it's not very long. It's what, an hour and 20 minutes? Hour 30? An hour 10. Hour 10. And it goes by in a breeze and i even watched it on tubi with commercials and it still just flew by i'd seen this um a couple halloweens ago uh because i'd been such a fan obviously of like the james whale universal monster movies and this is one that technically is part of that universal canon though it was kind of dismissed around the time it came out and was lost for a while until they found like a negative in the vaults of universal like in the late 60s and then they kind of re-released it put it back out there and it became more of this like cult appreciated hit and I get it because, like, this movie is so fascinating in terms of especially you can see so much of the influence it's had on, like, basically any movie that features, like, a bunch of people in a caught in the storm that go to an old house is inspired by this movie. Like, down to, you can see so much of, like, what the Rocky Horror Picture Show is kind of paying tribute to in this movie. Because of how so much it's just like, oh, we're these people who are caught in a rainstorm, we go up to this old dark house, and these weird characters that live inside this house, which, admittingly, when you got not just Karloff, who plays the butler Morgan character, but also Ernest Thessinger, one of my faves, uh, Dr. Pretorius himself, and his sister, the Eva Moore character, like, they're such fucking weird people immediately, where Thessinger is just like, oh, yes, welcome to my abode. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any beds. And she's even more just like, no beds, no beds. <laughs> just, they're such weird fucking people immediately. That contrast with our main group, who are much more sort of like put together 30s, kind of like fast talking folks, which includes Raymond Massey, Melvin Douglas, and of course, uh, Gloria Stewart, old Rose from Titanic herself. Oh my God, it is. Yeah. 
Yeah, I did. Oh boy. Yeah, I didn't even realize that. Yeah, um, and weirdly, like only about twenty years after the Titanic had sunk in real life. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it was her fault. <gasps> <laughs> she would have been like I don't know eight when that so? happened. <laughs> she, she pushed that iceberg out. <laughs> In the middle of the fucking ocean. Yeah, I mean, hey, you never know, man. Eight-year-olds can be dangerous. But <laughs> the cast of characters in this movie and sort of their performances and everything, are, are they're fucking great, dude. Like I said, you get the a lot of the sort of stuffed shirt, like, ah, how dare you talk to my wife like that? And yeah, she's a lady. And then you get the, you know, the sort of goofball, the group. You get the, the new group that comes in. It, it's just, I completely agree with you it, that, you know, Rocky Horror and any of those sort of, you know, car breaks down at a, at a country road. And, oh, no, there's just a lone, you know, structure with, like, one candle lit. Oh, let's go in there. They'll shelter us, which is never a good idea. Well, at the same time, I like the fact that the movie firmly establishes, like, this is their only option. Which is, like, a landslide happens as they're driving by. And it seems like there is no other possible safe structure except for here. As Ava Moore says, it's because it's built on rock. It'll survive, <laughs> which and I even love that when other people come in, they even say like, you know, this house is going to get washed up probably in this major tsunami that's basically happening outside here in the mountains of England or whatever. It just, it really firmly establishes that like there was no other option to go to this old dark house. And uh, when they arrive, they're just immediately offset, even with like the moment Karloff opens that door. Um, it's immediately unsettling with like just his makeup where he has this weird broken nose and he kind of mumbles because he has some sort of, uh, issue mentally. Uh, they say other things that are very old fashioned in terms of what yeah. he is. Basically, they apply it like he doesn't have much uh, of thought in his head, even though what I like about the Morgan character is just the big difference, I think, between him and, say, like a Frankenstein is that Morgan is much more sort of human in terms of his intent. He has clearly much more motivation and he has clearly many of the more foibles. Like, there's a scene later on where he's drunk. And he smashes open a window and shit like that. It just shows that, like, he is still, despite what people sort of think, like, oh, he's just completely, like, manageable. He's just our butler. We can have him do whatever he wants. He has clear motivation that they're not acknowledging because they dismiss him so much. Yeah, absolutely. And you you do feel sympathy for him in certain parts and all that, too. But he's also very intimidating, man, and very, very big and he's got such a presence about him and he's fucking boris karloff man he's scary as hell though it's weird realizing like for years i thought boris karloff was like he had to have been like over six feet or whatever dude was like 5 11 he was like average height to us basically right. it's just the way that like whale sort of shoots him that makes him seem so much bigger like either this or frankenstein yeah that's true we're both taller than him <laughs> <laughs> take that man who's been dead for over 50 years <laughs> yeah I, I was always going to say, fuck you, but that's kind of bait. Uh, but yeah. Why would you say such a thing about me, Adam? Why? I would shit my pants. <laughs> <laughs> the way he, James Whale especially, sort of shot him, it always made him appear just so much larger than life and bigger and menacing and, and just, it, he really... Those two really did a lot of special shit, man. I would say most of the movie, Karloff is very intimidating here, but near the end, after you mentioned the Saul character, but after that character meets his fate, and, um, you know, Morgan just comes up to him and, like, cradles his body like a child, it's weirdly very tragic and empathetic, and says so much, like, it implies so much about their relationship, as if, like, Morgan and the Saul character almost were, like, the only two people who had, like, an actual connection, because they were both treated as sort of, like, outsider monster characters by this family. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and, like you said, there's uh, the, the part where he's, you know, drunk and gets into the fight, and the guy throws the lamp at him when he falls down the stairs. But even at that point, you know, they they feel kind of bad for him, because you could tell, or he's like, you know, he checks, sees he's breathing, he's like, oh, he's just drunk, he'll be fine, all that stuff. Yeah, once he finds Saul and ultimately realizes he's dead and all that, like, it's just, it's kind of heartbreaking because you're like, ah, oh, this guy just, you know, he's in a shitty position for sure. And, and he feels guilty because he let out Saul and basically caused all this to eventually happen. Right, by the right, idea. exactly. Yeah. And I love how you're able to get so much that with, once again, this movie flies by at such a clip and is mostly filled with just like weird, bizarre, like horror comedy gags. 
that pop up. Uh, they're all courtesy of Whale. Like, I love the bit where Glory Stewart's trying to do, like, uh, shadow puppets, and all of a sudden, <laughs> Eva Moore's shadow, who is not in the room, suddenly shows up and, like, points at her. <laughs> it's like, oh, I can't believe what's going on. <laughs> like, so many weird, bizarre gags like that, or even the bit where Eva Moore's talking to Gloria Stewart in her room, just like, oh, yes, you believe in uh, pleasing your man, and all of a sudden, well, guess what? Uh, the silk will rot, and so will you. This will rot, too. You're, and she's, she's pointing to her skin. Like, all the stuff where you see the mirror shots that look like weird, cracked funhouse mirrors from various different angles. It's just like, what the fuck's happening? For, like, 1932, this movie is very weird and experimental and fascinating. Yeah, definitely, man. I mean, and that's the thing that's really the most shocking part about the movie to me, at least when watching it uh, for the first time, is, like, 1932? This feels like it's kind of, I don't know if I want to say ahead of its time, but it feels like it's sort of in a alternate version of 1932 because i've never really at least in this era you know there are comedies and there are sort of things like that that do exist but this one is so like tongue firmly planted in cheek and winking the comedy is not necessarily over the top but it's not really subtle either and it's so smartly done like none of it's really played for out and out laughs but there's just at least for me but there's just sort of this humorous tone to really the whole thing whale feels like one of the first guys to kind of get that if you're doing like a horror comedy thing you have to really like the best ones can balance like the horror and the laughs at the same time like this feels like a sort of 30s era precursor to say like an evil dead 2 in terms of like there's not over the top gore or whatever but there's just the right mix of like this is like bizarre and surreal and that but at the same time it's very funny and then also it has this great atmosphere that's so rich like despite the fact that like obviously it's a 30s movie it's not incredibly scary there are very scary shots like with Karloff the bit where Gloria Stewart looks out the door and then Karloff's hand just reaches out and closes it very immediately that's like a great example of like even at that era you can create such a simple but effective scare with that like I said the comedic tone never feels like too too much in the in you know front and center that's way that way when there are moments that are supposed to be sort of unnerving or scary they still really work i mean because let's face it how many times have we seen you know horror movies that try to be kind of tongue-in-cheek and it takes sort of the sting out of the creepiness or the scare of it there's very few that are really able to sort of balance that and when it's supposed to be scary it's scary when it's supposed to be funny it's funny and this is probably one of the earliest examples at least that i've personally seen that really does it the right way and does it well i think it also helps that like most of the comedy comes from like the character interactions i think particularly with like even earlier on melvin douglas who uh, plays the pedral character who basically raymond uh massey and uh, glory stewart are a couple and melvin is just like along for the ride basically even early on when he's like barbing out some like very funny like sort of 30s era joke kind of bits where he's talking about stuff like, um, oh, I don't want to scare her. And Chloe Stewart's like, oh, don't worry. I, I won't be scared by any of this. You won't? I am. <laughs> and stuff like that. There's like really funny, like quick banter that's there. And then to contrast it, you have somebody who comes in later who we haven't mentioned, but he's so boisterously funny in this fucking movie. Uh, the director of Night of the Hunter himself, Charles Lawton, who comes in later on. He's just, oh, look at all of you. Welcome. Yes, I'm here and I'm here to talk to you all about this. And he just has like this great delivery with every little bit where he just talks about, oh, I make so much money. And I'm so effective at it, you shouldn't get in my position, because you once you start making money, you don't even know how to stop it. Like, I love every bit of his dialogue in this movie. He's so good. Yeah, he's really good. He might be actually my favorite non-Karloff role in the movie. I mean, just when he comes in, you know, and the, the female of his group just bursts through the door, and in he comes, and, and yes, yes, we were... The car was crushed by a rock. <laughs> Thankfully, we weren't. <laughs> by the way, you know the house will be washed away soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he's fucking great in this. And I also really love the weird kind of like implied relationship between him and Lillian Bond, who plays initially what is assumed to be like, oh, his girlfriend. But as stuff is revealed between like Lillian Bond and Melvin Douglas about like, oh, um, he basically just keeps me around for company. And there's a lot of interesting hints at that time, especially given James Whale was an out homosexual director and Charles Lawton was a closeted bisexual at this time. Uh, a lot of hints about, like, oh, maybe he just keeps her around as basically a beard, essentially. Yeah, it's 100% what the situation is. That's exactly right. what's happening here. But for a 1932 movie to imply that and even say at one point, just like, oh, he just wants to appear as gay as possible. And it's like, hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Mm-hmm. No, he's just very happy. That's what it is, Universal. That's yep. totally what it is. <laughs> yep, that's how they I guarantee you that's how James Whale sold it. 
Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you know, I didn't really think about that until you just mentioned it for a movie from this year. I mean, not early 1930s. Absolutely not so suddenly uh, imply, <laughs> you know, the, something of that nature. It, it, it's real ballsy, especially for the time, but just to see something like that from then, you're like, wow, James Whale was pushing the buttons quite a bit and really trying to go for it a lot. And uh, I think that's kind of why I've always really sort of respected James Whale. Yeah, he was a real trailblazer at this time. And I even just love, even later on, as it becomes clear that, like, uh, Melvin Douglas and Lillian Bond are going to, like, run off together after this, after spending one night together in, like, the stable. <laughs> they instantly fall in love, are going to, like, marry each other. I just love, Charles Lawton isn't even pissed off about it. He's just like, I think you're mad. But sure, why not? I'll come to the wedding. <laughs> just, I love bits like that. Yeah, he did. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. I love that, too. It's like, uh, you know, what are you thinking about? I shouldn't tell you. No, please. Well, I'm pretending I'm your lover. <laughs> that I'm holding you tight, Gladys. Uh, <laughs> right. f- f- firmly pressing at your body. What do you think of that? I think I'd like to pretend that too. Then let's pretend. <laughs> no. <laughs> You're like, this is so fucking corny, but it's great. Right, but it works in a way that, like, you can tell once again, because the tongue is so firmly in cheek, he doesn't feel like the score would be swelling in a worse movie at, during that moment, as opposed to, it's plays just like this, like, fun back-and-forth banter that, like, makes you weirdly invested in this relationship that, once again, these people met each other an hour ago, <laughs> and they're just like, no, we're getting off and get married, like, sure, okay, fine, sure, I, I believe it. If an hour. Right. Okay. I mean... Yeah, but, oh yeah, no, they absolutely love each other. Look, there was a dissolve in the middle there, Adam. There could have been a couple hours. That's so much time to build up a relationship in a rapport. Yeah, that's true. Which, I do even love that, too. Like, Law- like that dissolve that happens in Lawton at one point, just like, a bunch of strangers sitting around here, and we don't know anything about each other. Well, let me tell you about me and my wife, who uh, everybody uh, downplayed her and all this other stuff. Like, I-, I love, like, how much that these quick conversations manage to reveal so much about these characters. Like, even the reverse with, like, uh, Melvin Douglas, where it's just like, oh, you know what? Uh, I don't respect fishes out of water, even if I am one. And stuff like that. It's just, it's really clever wordplay that still tells you about these people. And once again, the very limited screen time of this whole fucking movie. Yeah, that's true. I mean, they get a lot done with the time they have. I, I would say, you know, most of the characters are pretty well fleshed out. Like, you actually do kind of care about them and, sort of want to see what happens to them and stuff like that where uh, you know other movies even modern ones or all the way to movies made of this era a lot of times in movies like this the characters are so throwaway you know with this limited amount of runtime i mean look at even like the original uh the haunting well yeah you the characters you're defined but you, you don't really care about all of them I firmly disagree with that how dare you i will not have haunting slanter on this fucking podcast how dare you <laughs> i'll say whatever the fuck i want punk yeah and their consequences motherfucker <laughs> oh what are you gonna do fire me oh thank uh, god <laughs> you no know, you won't you won't record the show that only happens every couple months <laughs> right well what uh what, what are we at three times now <laughs> like, <laughs> a bit more but anyway yeah hey, whatever keep fucking around there'll be a seventh um <laughs> <laughs> But no, I, I mean, I just used The Haunting as an example, so, I mean, chill the fuck out. But other these older movies like this and stuff, or like you said, you know, these movies where a group of characters end up at this old mansion and stuff, they're usually not as well fleshed out. It's usually, like we talked about recently on our newest uh, On the Edge of Relevance, a lot of times they're just canon fodder characters. And I didn't get that from this movie at all. I mean, there are some characters that i maybe not as fleshed out, but... I, I would say the only one that really suffers is the Raymond Massey as the Philip character, who just feels uh-huh. kind of like the, I'm the, the one straight-laced man who's going to help out Gloria Stewart and, and all those other stuff. That he feel, even, which is very weird, considering also the connection here, that he was the guy who would later play the role Boris Karloff originated on Broadway in Arsenic and Old Lace, a movie that you kept saying you wanted to cover for this show despite the fact that he's not in the movie. <laughs> I know. I know, because I love that fucking movie so much. But, um... Yeah, I agree. I think when, you know, he's pretty much the guy I was alluding to. Where it's like, yeah, he's fine, but he is kind of the one note, just straight laced sort of character. But yeah, I, I think, like I said, in the short amount of runtime you have, and you get this really sort of large group of characters in this one little setting, and it works. It's all pretty well flushed out. That's, that's not an easy thing to do, especially for this time. Uh, but it, it absolutely uh, sort of works on all levels for the most part. 
Like, even characters who only have, like, very small limited amounts of screen time, like Elpish Dungeon as uh, Sir Roderick, the father who is, like, 104 years old and lives up there. We only have one scene with that guy. But immediately you see so much about, like, who this weirdo dude is just like, oh, yes, I've lived for 104 years, and I'm up here, and I just love doing that. Like, you get so much character out of this fucking weird performance from, we should mention, this female actress who's playing this old man part, <laughs> which makes it so, like, surreal and bizarre, but, like, it's still immediately fascinating. Uh, him, or also, of course, Saul, who we should mention, uh, Brember Willis, who is this fucking weirdo who, the moment you see him, he initially tries to... Uh, you know, convince Melvin Douglas, like, oh, no, I'm a nice man. They just locked me up because I witnessed a murder. You'll help me, right? And then he turns like an old cackling prospector man. Who's <laughs> just, like, fucking insane. Yeah, man, when he's fucking chucking the knife around and stuff, you're like, this is wild. And then it's like, he gets up and he's so little. And he's just running around and shit. <laughs> and they have a chair fight. It's just, it's so fucking great. There's a lot of chair fights in this movie, actually. But a lot yeah, of chairs least being tossed around, either by him or Carl, yeah, in particular. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's it, he's super fun. It's it's, it's such a manic, wild, over the top performance where it's like you can't help but love it. Yeah, and also a, a big shout out, obviously, as well to the set design in this movie of this house is so amazing. It feels like so gothic and angular and bizarre, like a house that no one would live in, but at the same time feels lived in because of just how like it's just dirty enough. Like it doesn't feel like. A, a true old castle or whatever. It just feels like a very rundown house that's been around for, it feels like, over a hundred years. And it just has, like, all this, like, soot and grime implied to it because of the way it's designed. It feels really unique even for, like, a universal monster movie, which this technically is a part of. And right. it's, so, like, and how would you feel, like, especially, you're more familiar with, like, sort of the traditional universal monster characters that exist. Like, how do you feel like this compares, like, any of the typical universal monster movie? I mean, it doesn't necessarily feel like it fits in there to me, but it, it feels like a nice little maybe offshoot or companion piece. Like, I, I think it works. Um, there's nothing as iconic in this movie, I would say, as those. I mean, even though, you know, like I said, through sort of osmosis or whatever, those images have been fed to you over and over and over. And maybe if sort of the Karloff character from this was just constantly fed into your brains and stuff, it would become iconic. I mean, especially helped by the fact this movie was basically lost for like 35 years after it came out. I mean, that'll do it. Right, that'll help it not be as culturally relevant right. necessarily as a Frankenstein they re-released every like two years in like the 30s through the 50s. Yeah, I mean, that's true. And there's new versions constantly on television and on stage and all that, but... I don't know that it ap- accurately feels like it's part of the monster universal horror canon. I mean, that's absolutely what it is, but it's just, it's so offbeat and silly that it, it just doesn't feel like it's part of that. It feels like it's at least like, I think it has a similar kind of like atmosphere to those movies, but at the same time, it has its own identity that makes it even separate from like the other James Whale sort of ones that would especially follow this point. Like this doesn't feel quite as manic in the same way as Invisible Man is, nor, like, even Bride of Frankenstein. That's what I think is so interesting, is that despite the fact that those three movies feel like they're from the same filmmaker, they still feel very divergent in the ways that they are in and of themselves. Like, fucking bonkers for movies being, like, the mid to early 30s. Bride and Invisible Man, for sure. (laughs) They're they're fucking crazy. Like, James Whale, that's the thing. Of this era and of these ilk and of these sort of the universal horror movies or just these classic gothic horror movies that were being made at the time, his voice was very unique. He always had, there was always sort of, not necessarily an overtly sense of fun to it, but there was always sort of a dark comedic lining in everything. I mean, even in Frank Stein, I know it's probably the least of the sort of the humorous ones out of the ones we've mentioned, but there are still moments in Frankenstein that are just so weird and silly and darkly funny. Yeah, there, James Whale, like I said, he did shit. Unlike any of the, uh, his contemporaries at the time, I would argue. Yeah, and particularly with just, like, if you look at, like, the original Frankenstein came out the same year as Dracula, and are both technically a part of the same universe, as it were, at that time, uh, they couldn't be more different movies, despite that. Like, especially, despite, like, James Whale also working, like, this is one of these movies that is occurring with, like, within the first ten years of sound being a fucking thing in movies. 
And you still have, like, such an interesting sound design even in this movie and the few uses of music and stuff like that. It feels like he's taking advantage of, like, oh, this is this new toy that I can play with, you know, the other sense besides, like, visuals in theatrical releases. Like, it feels like he was one of those guys who, like, was at the forefront of some of these early things. It's like, instead of just wowing someone with the simple fact of, like, look, you can hear someone's dialogue. It's like, let me see how weirdly I can warp that dialogue or warp these sounds that you're hearing of, like, the outside with the wind and the the way the doors even crack and or even it's such a weird bizarre like sound gag but whenever uh melvin douglas and lillian bond are in the that fucking barn how many times that rooster has to budge in with its fucking noises non fucking stop dude non fucking <laughs> stop <laughs> but but yeah uh, you know we have a whole nother movie to talk about adam so let's go ahead and uh, wrap up our thoughts here on the old dark house uh, adam first your final thoughts on the movie uh, I had a good time with it, man. It's it's not necessarily one that uh, I'll revisit frequently, but I, I really did enjoy it, man. It, it's got this real nice sense of humor to it, sort of tongue-in-cheek. Uh, Karloff's great in it. The directing's great. The sound design's really fun. The music's fun. The set design is really fun. Everybody's sort of given their time to shine for the most part. Uh, I, I think it's a really solid movie, and... and it does not feel like it's out of 1932. I mean, it definitely is, but it doesn't feel like it's strictly a 1932 movie. I, I really, really uh, thoroughly enjoyed this one. I would say it's also, it's not my favorite of sort of the whale universal monsters. Obviously, I love Bride of Frankenstein and Invisible Man a bit more and even the original Frankenstein. But this one feels, once again, it's like you said, like an interesting offshoot where it feels like it has the production value of those movies, but is using it to basically just innovate what the horror comedy can be at this particular point and does such a great job and has so many like wonderful like performances from all these cast members and just has this like fascinating design to it and this interesting humor mixed with the scares that happen that are even still scary to this day so many decades later almost you know 100, 90 years basically <laughs> at this point uh still has like a few bits that are at least like jump worthy as it were, and it still is like it's a very fun, spooky time. Like we we use the term spooky a lot. This is a movie that genuinely deserves the adjective of spooky. Yeah, I'll agree with that. But now let's get to a movie that I'm sure you could describe with a lot of adjectives, but it's hard to distinguish which specific one. Uh, we have the terror. I surprised her in the room. She was not alone. My own hands. I killed her. The terror. His evil mystic powers go beyond man's wildest imaginings. Take your life as you took mine. And bring us together forever. Join Boris Karloff, the Frankenstein monster of all horror motion pictures in his most blood-chilling screen experience. So, the terror uh, came out June 17th, 1963, so obviously this is about 30 years later, um, and is a Roger Corman production we've talked about a few times on the show. Mr. Uh, Roger Corman, director, mostly producer, who was much more famous for making very much schlock, even at uh, this particular time. And this is also during a point in Karloff's career where, like, uh, after the sort of 30s hey heyday, he was still consistently working in, like, the 40s and 50s, but uh, not quite as often but it's around like the mid 50s through like the end of his life in like 69 that like he had a huge resurgence especially with the invention of television uh managed to boost up his um you know sort of star status with like all of his movies showing on later television and he would pop up in appearances and stuff like that there so it bolstered his career to be able to do stuff like uh the raven which was a movie roger corman directed in 1963 uh that featured uh 
Karloff, Vincent Price, and Peter Lorre. Um, a fun sort of Poe adaptation. Which, sidebar, I just love the fact that Karloff made uh, both uh, The Raven 1963 and, like, back in, like, 35, he made uh, the one with Bela Lugosi for Universal called The Raven. I love that both those are technically, like, advertised as being based on the poem, but don't give a single fuck about the poem beyond, like, quote The Raven Nevermore. <laughs> like, both movies do not give a single fuck about the Poe story, which was a modus operandi for the various Poe movies that Roger Corman made in the 60s. The, the important thing with The Raven is the fact that um, while he was shooting that movie on these like elaborate gothic sets, Roger Corman realized, hey, I've got an extra couple of days. So how about instead of letting anybody go back home, I whip up a script with Leo Gordon that has vague things that we could have Karloff do on these sets for like two days. And we'll bring in a couple of, like, my ringers, like Dick Miller and Jack Nicholson, who will come in and shoot some scenes with him with a vague script that has, like, some sort of connection that will, you know, we'll fix it later. We'll shoot some more stuff. And uh, that shoot some more stuff ended up lasting about nine months as uh, Roger Corman hired several different directors to shoot various different things to stitch together some kind of movie with this, which included uh, Jack Hill, who shot a lot of it and was like the big script writer on it. Uh, Nicholson directed for a day after Hill had to leave. Uh, Monty Hellman, Dennis Jacob, and probably most infamously, the guy who was an assistant to Corman at the time and had worked on uh, Dementia 13, uh, which was directorial debut, uh, Francis Ford Coppola directed some bits of this movie and this movie is kind of I'm more aware of from its reputation I had never seen it before just like all those different directors participating trying to salvage some kind of movie basically like the uh concept of an exquisite corpse which is the game in which you're just like let me write like a bit of a story and the next person has to continue it and the next person has to continue it, it is very much that as a movie and uh, I'm curious Adam because uh, you would have just finished the terror right before we started recording um uh-huh. Were you able to process what was going on there? <laughs> I have no fucking clue what the hell I just watched. Uh, I, I I really don't know. I know uh, Jack Nixon plays a French soldier, so think of that. And uh, Boris Karloff does some stuff in it. And there's a bird lady and a lady covered with mud. And that's <laughs> that's about that's about all I took away from it. Uh, I, I it it is just. An incoherent mess. The stuff where I think it feels vaguely cohesive is the stuff where it's like on the sets of the the Raven, where it's like him, Nicholson, and Dick Miller, which I also love. Just like you mentioned, Nicholson's playing a French uh, soldier, and Dick Miller's trying to play the butler of Boris Karloff, even though like they're the most like northeastern American actors possible <laughs> to like be right along as like very British proper. Boris Karloff, and you got, like, Dick Miller just there, like, ah, what are you trying to do about the Baron? <laughs> it's just like, sure. Sure, man. Yeah, this is 1800s, like, Croatia, wherever the fuck this is. Sure, Dick Miller. That's where this is. Uh-huh. Yep. And, again, uh, I, I guess my biggest question about this movie is, uh, what? This <laughs> is 100%. What? Like, I, I've seen incoherent movies before and god knows roger corman is responsible for a lot of that but i uh uh i i still don't know what the hell i watched i still don't know what the fuck this was and what it was meant to be and what just huh <laughs> like, just, no way. wait uh, he killed my eric actually he is eric both physically and mentally in his mind, he's the Baron. What? Right, because, like, the basic vague setup is, like you mentioned, that uh, Jack Nicholson plays this French soldier who encounters a woman on the beach, and which apparently a lot of the stuff on the beach and on the rocks is shot by Coppola. And I think that's the stuff that feels the least the most visually interesting <laughs> of, of any of the stuff that's going on here, because it feels, like, very experimental and weird. That's, that's another thing. It's just the very different film styles that are going on throughout this movie. When it cuts from, like, scene to scene, it feels like either, oh, this is, like, an older, like, Hammer movie. Then it cuts to, like, what feels like very experimental, like, new wave of filmmaking <laughs> type of shit that's, like, bizarre. But um, Nicholson meets this woman on the rocks who apparently um, is, like, she's mysterious, and there's also this hawk that shows up or whatever, but um, he keeps chasing after her all the way up to this castle, where this guy who at least claims to be the Baron, played by Boris Karloff, is, and he explains, like, oh, yes, I used to have a a wife who I ended up catching uh, with a lover 
who was here and I ended up murdering her and all this other stuff that's like revealed a bit later. But um, basically it's like she looks exactly like this mysterious woman that Nicholson's been seeing. So he's like, oh, I've got to like find her and get her out of this like weird nether realm space. I guess that she's in at this castle. But everything in between is just introducing like a new plot element to kind of like work around this basic concept where it's just like, oh, look, there's the witch in the woods who, as it turns out, is like hypnotizing her into like maybe being like the bird. I think there's so many points where like, is she like the raven bird thing that like pops up occasionally? Can you like transform into a bird lady? Like, I don't know what's happening <laughs> with like the, the con- but there's like a basic story there, but the connection of material is like jarring every time they introduce some new element <laughs> yeah I I, I I I don't I don't know I I think she's the bird lady because even in the opening credits there's sort of like the the takeaway uh, or the the graphics of the woman turning into the bird and all that stuff like they definitely show all that not but still even then it's like I don't know what the fuck I'm looking at, man. Like, I, I, I just, I really don't know. And this movie, it is not the worst thing I've ever seen in any way. It, or even the worst for the show. But it is one of the more incomprehensible ones. I don't know what this movie is. I don't know what's happening in this movie. I don't, like, I, I, I get some of it and some of it, you know, but it, it, is it that simple? I Like, it's just... It's such a weird fucking just mix match of a movie. Like, it's just, I don't get it. To pay tribute to our subject, it's very Frankenstein together. Various parts stitched together to kind of make a person or a movie. I agree with you that I don't think it's, like, nearly the worst one that we've covered for the show because despite how, like, incoherent it is and despite the fact that a lot of this movie is people walking around because that's how much they shot, especially on the sets when they had them those two days, most of it was literally people just walking down hallways, walking up this way, walking up that way. Despite that, I'm not really bored by this movie. I think because when it's like 80 minutes long, and I think the entire time, because you're so confused, at least because I was so confused, I was so fascinated to like, I want to figure this out. I'm compelled enough to be like, is there going to be some kind of coherent structure to this? Is it all going to like reveal in something? And even when it doesn't, by the end, I'm still just like, well, I at least had a bizarre kind of fun and fascination with following this weird ride that we had. I don't know if you agree with that element of it. Yeah, I, I wasn't bored because of how bizarre it is and how fucking wacky it is. That's it holds your interest. I'll give it that. Um, I still think it's just it's a fucking wacky ass thing, but it's it's f- fun. <laughs> I, I don't know. Like <laughs> it's not necessarily one I would ever watch again, and I'd be hard pressed to find anybody that I could confidently recommend this to, but it's a, it's a movie. I mean, I guess it's like if you have sort of a fascination with like that production history, I think this movie only like engages much if you tell people like, oh yeah, this is pieced together from like six different directors, including Francis Ford Coppola. <laughs> I think that's the way to rope somebody and just like, oh, okay. Wait, it's like it mentioned the exquisite corpse thing. I'm just like, it's a story that's handed off from like one person to the next who tries to like have some big thing. Cause like the only stipulations Corman had about the script were that um, it had to be like, obviously be able to be shot in this castle. Um, and then also had to finish with a flood because most of the other Poe movies he'd done around this time had finished like a big fiery sort of stunt. And he was like, no, I want to end with like a big flood effect, which is very interesting, especially given um, poor Boris, who is like in his seventies, like the ending sequence of him, like fighting in that like flood against the uh, Sandra Knight character is like, I just feel so bad from like, get that old man out of the fucking water. He'll get pneumonia. Stop, stop. But uh, even that, though, with the Boris Karloff of it all, see, now he's the, you know, sort of man of the hour. Like, you could tell he's just near the end. Uh, Not necessarily at the end, but you could tell his health sort of getting to him at this point. Yeah, this is only about six years before you'd eventually pass away, yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of hard to watch even just for that. But ultimately, it's just, the fact that it's just such a nonsensical mess is really what, hurts this movie more than anything but at the same time with like Karloff I give him a lot of credit for like he was one of those dudes where he was in plenty of terrible movies it doesn't feel like he's actually half-assing it it feels like he has obviously a lower energy and a register because of his age 
But at the same time, like, when he's going off on these weird, very Poe-esque soliloquies, talking about, like, his lost love, or even talking to the Sandra Knight character, reacting, I'm sure off of fucking nothing. Because <laughs> fucking Roger Corman probably didn't give him anything. <laughs> Except, like, some fucking script lady off the side, just like, Oh, Baron, why don't you get the flood in so you could be with me? <laughs> or whatever. Like, he still was, like, giving as much as he can to, once again, a script that makes no sense, that has no real, like, connective tissue, especially for him, where he only has, like, the limited, like, 60 pages that were there for, like, all the stuff during the weekend at the castle. Like, I still would say that he's giving it as much as he possibly can. Yeah, no, definitely. It doesn't feel phoned in. It doesn't feel like a lazy performance at all. I think he's doing the best he can to his capabilities at the time, but it's still like, oof, this is sad. Yeah, there's a bit of sadness there, but at the same time, there's to at least counterbalance some of that, there is just the weird factors, like obviously young Nicholson, who if you see any of these like old Roger Corman movies, like Little Shop of Horrors, or even, he's also in The Raven, it is so fascinating seeing him at his like total like baby face stage, still at the same time have so much of that confidence that's there, like the scenes where it's him talking to like this fucking weird ghost woman who he sees at like graveyards and she's still just like, hey baby. I'm going to get you out of here. Like, he's literally just like, there are doctors who can cure you of death, <laughs> I guess. Like, he's still just like, nah, it's going to work. I'm going to make it work. Old Jack's going to make that happen. <laughs> yeah, what is the ultimate end goal there? Like, what is, what is he thinking, can, like, doctors can do? Especially doctors in, like, the 1600s or wherever the hell this movie's supposed to take place. <laughs> like, what are they going to do? <laughs> like, I just... Whatever, man. Way to go, Jack, I guess. He nearly drowned during, like, the Coppola shoots in the ocean. Like, there's a point where he tries to fight off a bird, which is hilarious. They try and fix it in editing, which is shots of a bird flying up, and then Jack's, like, in the water. just like, oh, I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you, birdie. And he, like, looks like he's drowning. But at the same time, it's just, it's like, it's so fascinating to see him try and, like, work around that, like, work with him once again, like, the old Roger Corman uh, element like you can tell like this is a guy who was raised like thrown into the wolves basically with like the Corman school of acting in terms of just like we have very limited time we don't have much of a script but you can make it fucking work right you and Dick can do it like him and D of course we love Dick Miller one of our faves we do a whole episode to him love seeing him in, like old Joe Dante movies here especially when he's playing off of like Karloff I think it, you can tell like he has a lot of fun with it and especially when I watched that Boris Karloff documentary uh, the moment that made me fucking, like, emotional, honestly, is that early on, Dick Miller is interviewed, and he talks about, like, seeing Frankenstein in the theaters, like, the first movie he ever saw. And then getting this script, which obviously Corbin was just like, oh, what's the script? Like, oh, well, it, there's really not much of a script, but you're going to go walk around hallways with Boris. And the way he describes working with Karloff, it's just like, it was a dream come true for me. Like, this is the guy who I first saw in, like, my first movie ever, and I'm working with him. Despite the fact of, like, the bizarre circumstances, I love that he managed to get that. It's, it's a really beautiful bit of that documentary. Yeah, that'd be like me getting to make a movie with Howard the Duck. <laughs> 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 That's the thing, you know, ultimately you can say about Boris Karloff, like, not a lot of bad shit about him out there. No, everyone described him as a very, like, professional, like, lovely man. Which I imagine, especially with, like, that lilting voice. Like, I love, like, this is the movie, obviously, we didn't get to talk about much of his voice in, like, the earlier movie. But the way that he has that lilt, that such fascinating sort of voice that lingers like this. That's even, like, different from other British accents at the time. It's so singularly Boris. It, like, works so perfectly. It adds a lot of gravitas to, once again, him talking to, like, Sandra Knight, who, Jack Nicholson's wife at the time. Who, depending on the scene, has either, like, blonde or brown hair or is, like, talking with Vaseline beneath, like, her chest area because she was pregnant after a certain point. So they had to hide her belly after a certain bit. And then they'll cut to, like, oh, here's a full shot of her talking to Jack Nicholson that was shot, like, three months previously. <laughs> it's just weird fucking shit like that. But he manages to make all of those scenes feel like there's some kind of weight there even if you don't feel it because of the dumb story. It, he tricks you into thinking that, like, no, this, this makes sense. This is legit. I get this story. I get what's going on here, Boris. Thanks. You're in, I'm in good hands. I'm in Boris's hands. Yeah, for sure, man. And the thing is, it's like, look, again, say what you will about this movie or whatever, but Karloff is going for it and he's trying. And seeing young Jack is always fun and the whole bird thing is it's silly and stupid, but it's you kind of got to watch it. The, the weird, like you said, because I noticed that too to the point where I was like, is this the same person? Like, why is she super blonde and then a brunette? Like, I right. don't understand. To the point when he first sees her, she's clearly blonde. And then it's, you know, oh, go talk to the Baron about her. He goes to the Baron, and he's like, I saw a dark-haired woman with dark eyes. And you're like, wait a minute. 
wait, what? There's two women? Like, it's just, it's wacky. It's got a certain level of charm to it just because of how insane it is. Right, and even just, like, the, the contrast, like I said, the, the, did you know sort of the distinctive, like, various different times where it feels like a different director took over? Even stylistically, how the movie looks at certain points? Yeah, no, 100%. Composition-wise, it's all over the fucking place, dude. There's scenes that you can't even tell what the hell is happening because of the dark. That are contrasted also with, like, the stuff that's on the beach that's, like, oversaturated. Like, all the stuff that feels uh-huh. on the beach, that feels like it's very natural, kind of laying obviously, because they're, like, on the beach and shit like that. But, like, that stuff where it's, like, him and Sandra Knight talking to each other on the shore. Or later on, there's this guy who we haven't mentioned, who, uh, Gustav, um, the uh, Jonathan Hayes character, who, like, is sort of the weird assistant to the witch lady, Dorothy Newman. And he is, like, going up, like, around the cliffs when the bird attacks again. His eyes get pecked out. And it's, like, super gory for, like, 1963. That's the other weird thing is just, like, the sort of horror context of it. Switch between being, like, a very sort of, like, drawn-out, like, Poe-inspired, like, oh, it's more gothic and ethereal to bizarre horror shit that suddenly happens. Like that, where his eyes get pecked out and then he falls off the cliff. Or when Dorothy Newman is suddenly just like, no, I can't go onto sacred ground. I made a deal with the devil. And then she gets struck by lightning (laughs) and just explodes. Uh-huh. And whatever the guy is that just is constantly whispering when he talks. Right, Gustav. I mean, yeah. yeah, it just... And it's the, the whisper is so amplified, you know, by through sound design that it's like, it doesn't make it sound ethereal. It just makes it sound bad. Yeah, like it's just like it toned up like ADR. Just like we have to pump this up as much as possible. It's a, it's a movie because it's Corman, where it's like I have to attach this to like the second part of like a double bill. Like there, this was one of those movies that played at like drive-ins all the time and stuff like that. This is so very clear, like a movie that like he did not trust because of obviously how ramshackle it was. That like in post, there is so much. It's just like let me crank up the sound. Let me like add in some ADR. Like overexposit some things, or especially the scene that like really shows just how like, bizarre this is, like, to contrast with the elaborate gothic sets from The Raven, there's literally a scene where it's just Jack Nicholson, Dorothy Newman, and Dick Miller, like, having an exposition off with each other that's, like, in front of a gray wall. And it's all, like, very close-up shots. (laughs) I guess that's the other thing you can say about this movie, too. It's not pretty looking. I mean, there's nothing about this movie that is pretty, right? I mean, I would argue the sets look very sort of, like, ethereal and interesting. Like, the ones that were actually there for The Raven... Like, the actual castle decor and everything. I think it all that stuff, like, looks, like, big and gorgeous. It, it, the problem, of course, is just the lighting is so bad. Because it's clear, like, oh, we have whatever lights we had left over from the Raven. <laughs> which is a much uh-huh. better looking movie by comparison. <laughs> but just, oh, like, way it, it, better. Way better looking. For at least some of it. But then, especially when he, like, goes into, like, the basement Karloff does. And you see, I mean, this shot is shown a lot of times where it's, like, him going through and there's, like, this weird kind of, like, gels that are everywhere. Like, one hallway is red, one turns a bit green. Like, even the opening bit, which is one of the more bizarre things, where it just opens with Karloff, pushes the candle thing to make the secret passageway open, goes down the stairs, walks around, opens a door, and a skeleton pops out. That's never uh-huh. comes back up again at all. <laughs> nope. Nope, nope, no point of that. That's the crazy thing about it, that it uh, it went those, you know, sort of nine months extra, because his movie feels like it was filmed in a fucking weekend, for sure. Right, it's the longest production time that Corman ever had on a movie. Not a shocker. No, because even his much better movies were done at an even quicker pace than this, but at least there's, like, a more consistent whole, as opposed to, once again, this movie that, like, switched so many different hands, had so many infamous production problems, and was clearly, like so bizarre at the same time like i said it's compelling all the way from like that skeleton scare all the way to the ending of this movie after the flood thing happens where jack nicholson's like look i saved you sandra knight we can get out of here and she's like yes we can oh no wait i'm sorry i have to melt in front of you (laughs) and and jack nicholson looks more just like annoyed like oh man i did all that for nothing (laughs) and literally the end pops up on like her melted face i know you expect a total wah, wah, wah. Or no, like, no, specifically, like, the, the Curb Your Enthusiasm thing to start playing, just like, bop, 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 Yeah. <laughs> Why not have her turn into that fucking skeleton, then? Like, this, this weird, like, looks like Wendy's Frosty just thrown on her face. <laughs> and just supposed to be like, oh, okay, right on. I, I just, it, this fucking movie, man, it's, it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this movie is wild, bro. 
Yeah, but I get at least the sort of fascination, especially, like, all the way down to, like, after this movie came out. Like, it obviously, like, it went to public domain, because there's it was done so quickly that Roger Corman didn't put any kind of copyright notice on the credits. So this went quickly into public domain. But then afterward, like, in the 90s, Corman was like, wait a minute, how about I add some extra footage in here where I'll have Dick Miller do, like, a wraparound in which he plays, like, the older version of his character who, I guess, survives this ordeal? Sure, I guess. Um, and he's just like, oh, I remember the Baron back in my day. And it would cut to, like, the actual footage. <laughs> like, that's how immediately she was like, he wanted to make some kind of money and release that, like, in fucking France where it would, had never come out. It's just like, oh, this is a new movie. I shot some stuff last year for it. And by some stuff, I mean five minutes where Dick Miller's just like, I remember back in my day. <laughs> that's the one thing you could say about Roger Corman. Constantly trying to figure out a way to make a buck. That's true. A, a new and creative ways to siphon as much money as possible off old shit. <laughs> but, that's, but this movie is at least a testament to that, given the, the genesis of it was just like, I have two days with these sets available. Let me just shoot some shit with Boris and then I can figure it out later. <laughs> like, that's the enterprising, fascinating thing about Corman, that he just has such an instinct to be like, I can't waste a single thing. Let me use every single possible spare second I have to make some kind of movie I can get out there and make a couple bucks off of. <laughs> Which, God bless him. Oh, yeah, I mean, I mean, and how many sets were recycled over and over and over and over and over and costumes and everything. I mean, you know, pretty much if you go to an era of Roger Corman movies, like be it from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, whatever, chances are you're going to see some set or costume or prop reused a couple times. Like, the dude just did everything on the cheap and everything with the idea of making, you know, his budget back tenfold and he usually is successful i mean the guy's still doing it yeah and he would support filmmakers to be able to at least kind of do that within the limitations like i think we'll be talking about that with footage from this movie uh, appears in uh one of our picks for our recurring segment that we'll be doing uh after we wrap up here on the terror yeah yes uh but but let's go ahead and do that wrap up here adam your final thoughts on the terror it's fucking wacky it's wild it makes absolutely no sense but because of that, it has this sort of certain level of charm to it. I, I, I really, I don't know what I think about it. I don't know if I absolutely hate it, if I love it, if I think it's just kind of okay. I, I don't know, because I don't even know that it constitutes a movie. It, it's just this weird thing that exists. And I guess for that, I, I mean, I guess it's pretty cool. I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I this isn't a movie by most standards. It's just... It's a thing that exists that I saw. That's about as good as I can give you. I would, I guess, also classify it less as a film and more of an interesting cinematic artifact. Like a movie that could have only come from, like, the specific time and place with Corman. Where it was just like, oh, hey, what could go wrong by using some new footage from Karloff and then, like, piecing it together with other stuff we'll film later? It'll totally work out fine. This is an interesting just case study in that weird like i said the exquisite corpse thing of just like doing that but instead of just a group of people doing that with a piece of paper in the story that's going around it's a bunch of people using so much film equipment costumes various different actors they could get either on the day or later like it's it's this fascinating sort of weird experimental film it is genuinely like a weird experimental film that is like so bizarre to watch but at the same time could only come from, like, not a filmmaker who's just trying to be like, oh, how could I push the boundaries of art and do whatever I possibly can, man? It's Roger Corman, like, we need to finish this so I can put it in theaters next to the bride of the monster or whatever the fuck that I've just made. <laughs> like, I need to have, like, something I can build with that so we gotta finish this up as soon as we possibly can so we can put it out there and, like, make a bit of money off of it. And I, it's this weird, fascinating convergence of, like, crass commercialism and like fly by the seat of its pants filmmaking from various different filmmakers that makes it incredibly fascinating as just like an object if nothing else it is a unique object in film that if you're a film fan and you have any curiosity especially about like this low budget 60s era and just like the early starts for like nicholson and coppola and even like Miller, but also the last days of Karloff and sort of uh, Corman in his heyday. It's a fascinating object. I would recommend to anybody who's at least fascinated by that idea enough, even if you can uh, at least brace yourself for the fact that it's not going to make much sense. But I'll say this much. It's at least the better Coppola directed movie that involves uh, a Jack as its lead. Yeah, I'll give it that. 
<laughs> yes, <laughs> for sure. But uh, let's go ahead and go into our weekly segment item of the double redo. Double redo. Double redo. Double redo. Double redo. Double redo. Double, 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 redo. That works. So the Double Redo is a segment that uh, we do every week uh, in which uh, we talk about a good and a bad movie um, based on the topic, uh, you know, to bring up just like as a recommendation to everybody out there. If you're curious, like, oh, after this episode, I want to watch some more Karloff movies. Well, uh, each of us will bring up a, a good movie we want to recommend to you and then a bad one we'd steer you clear of. And uh, I'll go ahead and start here. And uh, both of mine are actually from the 40s, so I'll go chronologically. With uh, I'll first have my bad pick from 1940 of The Ape, which stars Karloff and is this very like low-budget movie that only is about an hour long. And it was one of his uh, contracted movies with a studio called Monogram Pictures. And uh, basically, the, the premise of this sounds interesting, where it's Karloff plays a guy who's a doctor who's trying to cure this young woman uh, of her paralysis by like getting spinal fluid from various different people. Um, an attack happens from this ape who escapes from the local zoo and crashes into Boris Karloff's home. And he's like, Oh, I, I have to murder this ape. But in the process of like getting rid of this ape, all of his uh, spinal fluid that he had left over to potentially cure this woman uh, crashes on the ground. So he's like, damn, I need more spinal fluid. How am I going to make this work? Wait a minute. This ape has escaped and everyone knows it, but no one knows that I've killed this ape. So I'm going to skin this ape and wear this ape's skin as a costume, go around murdering people and taking their spinal fluid. <laughs> that is an insane premise that I was like, okay, let's see how this goes, movie. Let's go ahead. And um, it's incredibly boring despite that. Very dull, like extremely low budget filmmaking, even like lower budget than like a Corman to the degree that it's just like, it's a lot of people just kind of like talking in rooms and occasionally this really bad ape suit shows up. And it's not nearly as, like, engaging or weird or fascinating as it could be. And despite being only, like, 62 minutes long, it feels so much longer. This feels more embarrassing to me than, like, Karloff and the Terror. Because it feels like he's, like, knows he could be doing better other things. And he still has, like, several, like, at least like, 20 or so years left in him. But he's like, oh, I'm stuck doing The Ape. Whatever the fuck this is. Like, it's a movie that's more coherent than The Terror, but it's still so much duller. Um, and then my good pick is uh, one that I actually watched uh, just to, in sort of prep for the show. I watched some other Kar Karloff movies, and this is one I'd heard a lot about and I think is, like, maybe his best just genuine performance that isn't, like, a monster performance necessarily in the traditional sense. I have uh, 1945's The Body Snatcher, which uh, takes place um, in sort of, like, the 1800s, around the time of Burke and Hare, which is brought up a lot, which, if you don't know, is this actual story of, like, these guys who were uh, undertakers that would murder people and take their bodies out and sell them off. Um, and so it's sort of in the wake of those crimes that have happened. And uh, this mainly follows, like, our protagonist who is, like, studying to be a doctor underneath uh, this uh, main uh, doctor uh, played by uh, Henry Daniel. And uh, while he is teaching, these, um, he gets his cadavers from this mysterious undertaker played by Boris Karloff, who has, like, a big top hat and, like, huge sideburns and, like, a, he seems like a sort of, like, weird gentlemanly guy who's, like, very jovial when he comes around. He's just, like, despite, like, oh, I'm an undertaker, I can still have, like, fun and be boisterous with everybody. But as the movie goes on, you find out that basically him and the Daniel character have been working with each other to where, like, he's been murdering people and sending over the bodies so that he can keep sitting, because Daniel's another precaution of, like, oh, no, uh, this is all for good, because I'm trying to, like, learn more about the human body, the human anatomy, especially, like, the 1800s, you don't know so much, but I need more human test subjects. This is for the good of mankind. While Karloff is just, like, really, not only doing this because he has, like, the sick pleasure of killing, but more importantly, Karloff is, like, a sort of puppet master for this guy, where he's just like, oh, guess what, yeah, you you, th you think that I'm just sort of this gentlemanly, uh, you know, murderer who just gives you these bodies, well, guess what, I have all this dirt on you, I have so much, like, the, when you find out more about his past and stuff like that, there's so much to where he's basically controlling this man, and it's such a fascinating performance from Karloff, it's very sinister, very wicked, but also very charming in its weird, roguish way, and the main protagonist guy is, like, fine, he's, like, he's a solid sort of, like, gateway into this interesting story as he like learns more and more and it's directed by robert wise uh who would later go on to make stuff like the sound of music and 
uh, the West Side Story and stuff like that. He would become like a really big director in the 60s, but this is sort of like him in an early stage of his career. And you still feel a lot of like this interesting atmosphere. One of the victims is this woman who like is a beggar that sings all the time. It's very haunting and it's very ethereal the way that she's presented. And there's other fun people like Bella Lugosi has a small role in this movie. And him and Karloff have uh, a couple scenes together, especially their, their final scene is uh, one of the more brutal, just sort of, like, murder scenes. Spoilers for this fucking ancient movie. Um, but, like, when he kills Lugosi, it is, like, intense and raw in a way that's, like, upsetting. I think it's it's a great movie that uh, I'd heard some things about. It feels like it's sort of, like, the underrated gem of the Karloff filmography, and I would definitely recommend it to anybody out there. It's a really great, spooky watch that's not as, like, traditionally sort of monstrous and supernatural as so many of the other Karloff performances, but I think it is genuinely maybe his, like, most scary, uncomfortable performance that just is, like, genuinely intimidating, despite the jovial charm that he would usually display. All right, so, yeah, I've, uh, I've never seen Ape. I, it doesn't sound like I want to. Uh, <laughs> historically, a lot of movies that have the word ape in the title don't usually work. Your good pick's a classic. I mean, obviously. It, it's one of his more well-known ones, I'd say. And uh, for a good reason. Uh, I mean, I've definitely seen it. I haven't seen it in a long time. So that'd be a fun one to sort of revisit. But uh, it, it's sort of one of those... It was all on Turner Classic Movies a lot and things like that, especially during the season. I mean, I guess I would say, like, I, I, people who are in the know more about film would probably know about The Body Snatcher, but I feel like that one has been a bit more lost to, like, bigger audiences compared to, like, say, the Frankensteins and such. Yeah, I guess that's true. But I don't give a shit about those people. Um, so anyhow... Uh, <laughs> Even if they are listeners, go fuck yourselves. Yeah, yeah but join Patreon. Uh, so I... Um, <laughs> For my good pick, I have one of his later movies. If not, I mean, it very well could have been his last movie. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that, to be honest. I, I know that uh, he did a couple that were like specially released posthumously after this. So, but it's he has said as much that the movie you're about to mention is like his what he feels is his last movie. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And it's uh, Peter Bogdanovich's first movie. It is from. 1968, it is the film Targets. Targets I, is another one of those that I saw a long time ago. I, I've seen it probably within the last couple of years again. It's good, it's dark, it's disturbing, and it still really holds up. And, uh, you know, Karloff basically plays kind of a version of himself. You know, he plays this guy, Orlock, who's an old horror star and who can't catch get work anymore and all this stuff. And then while all this is going on, there's a, a psycho going on a killing spree. And it's just, it's really fucking good. I, I really, really enjoy Targets quite a bit. It's uh, thrilling. It's, it, it's you know, I want to call it horror, but it definitely has horror tinges, of course. Uh, but yeah, I, I really, really enjoy Targets. And uh, then for my bad, I have, uh, you know, as we've sort of mentioned, he got really saddled with the idea that he was, you know, he was Frankenstein and it was his biggest claim to fame and all this stuff. So he did quite a few uh you know other frankenstein movies like there's frankenstein 70 that's really lousy but i'm particularly talking about um house of frankenstein from 1944 uh you know and the thing about it is it, it, it a lot of people sort of it got i don't want to say popular but it does play a lot because of its cast I mean, you got Boris Karloff, there's Lon Chaney Jr., there's John Carradine, pretty huge cast, and it's all the, you know, the main three kind of joining together, which Dracula, Frankenstein's monster, and the Wolfman, who are helping, you know, the Karloff character, who is Dr. Gustav, and it, it's just not necessarily the worst of his Frankenstein offshoots. It's more of a frustrating mess because it's kind of like something, you know, being a Universal Monster Movie fan and things like that, that you would really love to see and it could be so cool and everything. But it's just kind of incoherent dribble. Not as bad as, say, The Terror, but uh, it's just, it never connected for me. Um, yeah, I have seen uh, both of your movies. Uh, Targets is incredible, I think, um, especially, it's such an interesting contrast for, like, the fact that they have this, like, big assassination plot that's shot very, like, almost cinema verite to contrast with, like, Karloff as this, like you mentioned, like, a horror star who feels like he's kind of out the window. Um, it feels like it's an interesting contrast between, like, 
old horror is dying and what the new horror is is something much more tangible and upsetting of a fucking guy who was just going around murdering people. A dude just looks like an average, clean-cut American boy, quote-unquote, um, is going around just murdering people. And especially considering it came out in 68 during, obviously, a lot of you know turmoil related to assassinations really hitting the American landscape. It feels like it was just like it hit into the zeitgeist in an interesting way that I don't believe was intentional. But just kind of feels like it's tapping into that specific, like, bizarre danger that sadly is still relevant. And then I kind of referenced this earlier, but the interesting thing about Targets was it was greenlit by Corman because Bogdanovich wanted to make a movie after he'd worked with Corman on a couple of productions in the 60s. And Corman was like, okay, you can make a movie, but um, I can give you a couple days with Boris Karloff. He owes me a movie. So you'll have to shoot about 20 minutes worth of stuff with him. Then you have to use 20 minutes of older stuff I already have with Karloff, which ended up being in the movie within the movie, where the Boris Karloff horror actor character is uh, going to premiere one of his movies at a drive-in. The drive-in movie is The Terror. Um, so you see that projected on the screen. And then 20 minutes of other stuff, which ended up being all the stuff with the uh, mass shooter character that we see. Karloff has like a great monologue that he does like during the first act of the movie that's really incredible. It like speaks to, it feels like it's him talking about his status as a horror star and how he feels like his work didn't mean that much necessarily. It's a beautiful monologue from him. And it's so fascinating that with that ingenuity, he ended up creating this movie about like the status of horror cinema and even really getting into the zeitgeist of the time. It's just such a fascinating thing where once again, the necessity is the mother of invention as we like talking about on the show. And it's such a great showcase for what you can do, how creative and bold and interesting can be within parameters that are limited by a schlocky producer like Roger Corman. Um, and then House Frankenstein was part of sort of the uh, like binge of Universal Monster movies they did before our episode that we did that Adam was unfortunately not a part of. Um, but um, it was an interesting kind of look into like how degrading, especially like the Frankenstein related movies are, where I kind of mentioned earlier, like this is coming off Ghosts of Frankenstein where Lon Chaney played the creature and it doesn't work. And then this one was planned to be more of like an actual reunion where they're going to get like, oh yeah, Claude Rains and Bill Lugosi and like everybody. That's how it was initially announced. Like we're actually going to have the big team up everybody would want from this particular movie. And a lot of people dropped out and this movie feels like it's a weird hodgepodge or even like John Carradine playing Dracula. It feels like it's a weird just anthology segment in the middle of this movie because he doesn't interact with anybody else. He just like is introduced and within like 15 minutes of him appearing, he dies. It's like this weird short film about Dracula <laughs> that's popped into this movie just to basically like fill up time. It's like 70 minutes long, but it's definitely like it feels like it's this weird hodgepodge that just doesn't really feel like a coherent movie. Like, I would say it's much less interesting than The Terror, because it's just, like, it doesn't feel like it has any of that creative, interesting spark to it. It just feels like Universal having to, like, fill a bill, and it feels a lot more lifeless and drab by comparison. And especially even Karloff, as much as he's trying, just, like, it, it feels so bizarre to see him next to Glenn Strange, this version of Frankenstein, that was kind of, like, throughout the rest of the Universal run was the guy who played Frankenstein as much more of, like, the lumbering, oh, uh, you know, fire bad, like, all that stuff that feels like such a lesser version of the character. And it's not necessarily the worst of those. The worst of those that I've seen, at least, is the one that's, uh, like, House of Dracula, I believe it is, that's even shorter than that movie and has like mostly stock footage in it but uh yeah house of frankenstein not the shining moment of the universal canon necessarily nah nah it's not nah 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 uh but let's go ahead and repeat our titles for everybody out there uh for my good i had the body snatcher and for my bad i had the ape uh, and for my good i had targets and for my bad i had house of frankenstein Yes, no, we'll go ahead and uh, get to the end of the show, but stay tuned. We'll be doing our picking for next week at the very end. Uh, but I want to thank some people first, like Chris Oliver for doing the intro and outro music used for our show. Listen to more of his music at chrisoliver.bandcamp.com. Thanks to Christian Thor Lally for our artwork. I'll follow him at Night of Water at various socials. That's Night with a K, underscore of, underscore water. And thanks, of course, to our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash dedbpod. For just $1 a month, you get to do stuff like vote in polls for topics or movies that we cover and get to listen to bonus podcasts that we release just for anybody who pays that $1 and becomes an edgelord, as we like to call you. Right now on the Patreon, you'd be able to hear our latest episode of our show called On the Edge of Relevance, in which Adam and I cover very recent movies, and we did our own double-edged double bill of uh, two uh, very recent horror releases where we talked about 
Hellraiser 2022, the reboot, and then, of course, Halloween Ends, um, which uh, is a very interesting discussion, especially the Halloween Ends bit of it. A lot of back and forth about that movie. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah. Yeah, just listen to the Patreon thing. I don't want to say anything else about it. Right, for sure. Uh, but you'll also be able to listen to, by the end of the month, we're planning on putting out a media discussion uh, in which we talk about Midnight Mass, which we're very yeah. excited to record. We, we both uh, have a lot of affection for that particular series, and we'd love to uh, discuss it in full on the Patreon. And then, of course, also, uh, speaking of the polling... Uh, you all get to vote between two topics we're going to cover for next month. As we've mentioned previously, next month is going to be called Revember, in which we revisit topics we've previously done on the show before. And uh, with with that, that means uh, that we're going to have you guys vote between two topics that have been sort of in the back pocket that we've covered previously, like ones we would like to cover again. And so you all get to pick uh, which one we do cover again. Um, it'll be between uh, us revisiting holiday films, which we haven't talked about since the first year of the show. Like, I think uh-huh. it's like episode 31 or something oh, like that. It's very God. early in the history God. of the show. And it's always been the, kind of like the one that's especially been like, in case we can't, there's nothing relevant at the beginning of December, we'll do this. But it usually, you know, has gone to the wayside for other topics. But you all get to decide if we will definitely cover that or anime uh, films, the second edition of that, which was more around like episode 120 or something like that, much more recently, but still, uh, two interesting topics that um, we are curious to see which one you would want us to revisit. That should be up, honestly, around the time this episode comes up, which, sorry, this one's late. We had some, you know, delays in recording and releasing this one, uh, but you should be able to vote on that now if you're just a $1 patron. Yeah! And yeah, it's my fault that it's late. I'll take ownership of that shit. I was out of state. Go fuck yourselves. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm good with either one of those. Like, I, I, I think it could be fun either way. Yes, uh, but it's all up to you patrons out there to vote in that poll. Um, and for more of uh, our operation, find us on Twitter and Facebook at DEDVPod. And you can also submit feedback to us uh, either there through messaging or doubleedgedoublebill at gmail.com, all spelled out. And uh, for more of me specifically, find me on Twitter and Letterboxd at Not the Who's Tommy. And you also do some writing at uh, MarianiThomas.wordpress.com and at film cred.com. Ah, uh, just if you wanna. Uh, no, I'm not anywhere. Leave me alone. I'm at Letterboxd, I guess. Schwanson. S C H W A N D T S O N. I don't really go on Instagram anymore, so it's not like any of you even sought me out. You parasites. That's a weird contradictory thing where they're parasites, but they didn't seek you out. They're sucking on your flesh, but they didn't even bother to look you up. So what, what does that mean? I don't know. I'm so alone. I'm so lonely. <laughs> that insult made about as much logical sense as the terror. Well, hey, fuck it, man. Fuck it. All of it. <laughs> uh, well, for more of that fucking energy, uh, follow us on places like Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and other podcasting platforms. If you're listening on Talk Film Society, you want to listen to all the other great shows on the network. And uh, you can also dig into our archives and our Podbean main feed for like 200 episodes before we even joined Talk Film Society. And anything else, if you can't, you know, support us on the Patreon, that's cool. Money can always be tight. But the free way to help us out is to rate, review, or simply share the show around to get us more visibility, more listeners on our side. Yeah, please. And if you are a new listener who's just come across us somehow, uh, just, you know, drop us a line. Tell us what you like about the show. We'd appreciate it. If you're big Karloff heads, you just wanted to yeah. listen to this episode. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Adam, maybe they'll have more luck with next week's topic, which uh, will be the last one for the October season. I know we're all sad. It's heading toward Halloween here. Um, <sighs> our last sort of horror-focused episode, uh, which will be werewolf films, as decided on by our patrons. They voted on a poll for which a horror sort of subgenre we would do, and the poll was between witches and the ultimate winner of werewolves, which is, you know, one we've wanted to do for a bit, but, you know, we're not just doing it until the patrons officially declared we must. Yeah, then I'm cool with it, man. I've always liked werewolves. I've always liked werewolf movies. Uh, to me, they were always the scarier of the sort of those creatures when I was a kid. Uh, they always creeped me out, especially there was that one TV show, and I can't remember the fucking name of it now, where the guy had a bloody pentagram in his hand anytime he was changing. It, it, werewolves always, always creep me out. And uh, now I think they're just cool. Like, they don't scare me anymore, because, you know, hot take, everybody, not real. I'm a big boy now. I'm not scared by werewolves <laughs> yeah, anymore. Yeah, you boy. Uh-uh, I put on my pants the same as everyone else now. 
boat legs at a time and awkwardly. But yeah, no, I, I always, I've always had a fascination with werewolves. I think it's sort of just a cool idea that, you know, changing to your basic primal sort of self and becoming this ultimate hunter, killer, whatever sort of machine. I, I've always been into the idea of werewolves. By the way, is this werewolf show you're referring to Werewolf from 1987? That was probably it, yeah. Uh, one season, 28 half hour episodes yeah that's it but but yeah we're talking about two films obviously and i have the two good picks you have the two bad picks we usually like to switch off on the quality for who has the picks and we've assigned each of our picks number between one and ten when the other person picks a random number like hey i'm gonna pick number seven the other person who has the picks will be like okay that's close to number six which is this blank movie and thus that is the good one and the bad one we cover unless someone implements the godfather rule which Adam and I each have a single veto in our back pocket. We've had it since May. We have to use it by next May in time for our next anniversary. And so if we hear someone say like, oh, this, this particular movie is what's at number six, we could say, actually, I don't want to cover that one. So I'll take the cannoli. Thus, that choice is gone. We have to go with whatever other feature is the other choice for that. And that might happen with werewolves, Adam. So why don't you go ahead for my two good picks, pick a number between one and ten. All right. Let's just go ahead and go with number eight. Okay. Over at number nine, I have uh, one that's maybe the quintessential werewolf movie from the year of many werewolf movies, 1981. I have an American werewolf in London. I mean... <sighs> now, I I could get... Despite how famous this movie is, there's some reasons we'll probably bring up that yeah, you don't want to necessarily one. cover it. One main one, yes, but... Yeah. so. You, do you want to take that cannoli, Adam? I mean, no, I can't, right? I mean, this is the quintessential, like you said. This is the ultimate sort of werewolf movie. You know, don't wrong. The, Ho the Howling, really same year, great movie too. But this is the one. So, yeah, no, I'm not taking the cannoli. Especially of the modern werewolf movies, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, but on the other side of things, I had what I would argue is one of the ones uh, from a more recent sort of uh, era that I would say has a contention for still being one of the better werewolf movies, especially of the new millennium since it came out in the year 2000. Over at number one, I have Ginger Snaps. Yeah, it's a solid fucking movie too. The first one especially. Uh, then it gets goes off the rails. But the first one, yeah, for sure. Shocking that directed video sequels go off the rails after a great original movie. That never happens. I know. Especially with horror. Yep, never. Not once. First time it's ever happened, Ginger Snaps. Right. But... For your two bad picks, Adam, um, I'll go with the opposite end of things. I'm going to go with number three. All right. So I had a wealth of titles to choose from because there was a lot of bad werewolf movies. But I, I think I landed on one that I've seen that I do like aspects of, but it's not great. I have uh, the Michael Pare starring Bad Moon. Okay. I've heard of Bad Moon. I've seen like clips of Bad Moon that look fascinating. So you know what? I'm definitely not taking that canola. I'm very curious to see Bad Moon. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then at the opposite end, at number 10 on the dot, I had... That's a really bad movie. I have uh, Skinwalkers. Oh. I think I've heard of Skinwalkers. I've oh, not seen Skinwalkers. Oh, 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 boy. Well, yikes. Uh... All right, but uh, we'll go ahead and uh, see a uh, Bad Moon Horizon with American Werewolf in London and Bad Moon. I see what you did there. Yes, yes. Uh, next time. Uh, but until then, everybody, uh, I guess this is the end of the show. And I don't know how to end it, so my face is going to melt in front of Adam now. Bye! John Fogarty's going to sue us. Mm -hmm.